thanks for coming and thanks for inviting me. Um, I thought what I would do is to start by creating a, a context of sorts by showing you a few images of artists whose work is something that I've thought about a lot or that I return to often. Um, my work is really in a sort of a large conversation with a lot of other artists' work. Um, I could probably do an entire talk about nothing but all the people I love and who I look at all the time or think about. Um, it's, for me, my work is very woven into a kind of web of references of other artists' work. And one of the people who I have the longest relationship with is Max Beckmann, who's a German artist from the first half of the, the 20th century. I've been looking at him since I was a student at Cal Arts in the 70s. Um, in fact, in my beginning painting class, um, my friend Tom Mantell, who's a wonderful painter, was the first person to introduce me to Beckmann, which was very much a part of the texture of Cal Arts. Cal Arts, the, the students in the 70s were teaching each other as much as the instructors were teaching the students. Beckmann in, sticks with me and moves me over the decades because for many reasons, his, his compositions are fascinating. The skin of his paintings is really intriguing. It's very, very different from the kind of, of surface that I create in my work. Um, his sense of color com completely contradicts my sense of color, which I find really intriguing. He uses black both as a way of drawing and also as a color. And I never use black. And I find myself really drawn to looking at work often that does not look like my own as a way of sort of thinking more freshly about what I'm trying to do. And one of the things that sticks with me the most about Beckmann is the way his work traffics in a kind of allegory or fantasy, but it is not something one can pin down. You can't say in Beckmann that a horn always represents this, or a fish represents this. Um, his sense of how things contain meaning is something that's malleable. It shifts constantly. It depends on the context. And as you'll see, my work often also traffics in allegory and fantasy. But I've been interested in thinking about a way that that can be something where meaning changes from picture to picture instead of being a hard and fast thing. The other thing that has really, really influenced my art is Indian painting, Indian court painting from really the 17th through the 19th centuries. This is a painting from um, Mewar, and it's, I don't know the exact day, it's probably 18th century. Um, Indian painting, the Indian painters have the most sophisticated sense of color of, of any group of painters I can think of. It's just, it's had a huge impact on how I think of color. One of the things that they do is they don't use color necessarily naturalistically. They use color to amplify emotion, to create a different kind of narrative in the work. In the case of this, a woman is laying on the bed gazing at her lover, and the whole room is suffused with this kind of glowing honey yellow color. And the other thing that I love in Indian painting is the way space works. Space is not as we think in the West, where it's just you know, a one-point perspective. Instead, you know, things flip up, they splay out, they move in all directions. Again, space is used to, to amplify narrative and amplify emotion and change the way that you move through a picture. And that's had a huge impact on how I think of my own work. And this is a drawing by Pat Steer. Um, Pat is an American artist. She's um, still working. She's in her 80s. There's a beautiful, beautiful Pat Steer painting in the Joan Didion show that just opened at the Hammer. Um, Pat was one of my teachers in grad school, and she had an enormous impact on me. I told her later that it was like working with an old Zen master where you, you, you know, go to the Zen master every week thinking you've solved the koan and the Zen master hits you on the back of the head and goes, no, it's wrong, go back, you know. And, and I would go to Pat every week. I, I, Pat's drawings, this is very typical of what she was doing at the time. The drawings partook of kind of journals and diaries and diagrams and ways that markings create kind of the sense of how you read a surface. And I would go to Pat every week having done um, 
examples of things that I thought looked like Pat Steer drawings. And she, I remember the first time I met with her, she never smiled. And the first time I met with her, she just looked at my drawings and she said, these are very handsome. And I said later to one of my friends, I've never heard a more damning word in my whole life. <laughs> um, I, Pat and I reconnected years later and I, I told her that even though my work is very, very different from her work, I have constantly thought about Pat's injunction that a drawing is about a drawing and a painting is about a painting. And I don't think of my work in the kind of conceptual way perhaps that Pat does, but that, that urging to think of how a drawing speaks about drawing and how a painting can speak about painting is something I've really have been fascinated with weaving into to my work and thinking about a lot. Um, this is a small dry point by Lovis Corinth. Lovis Corinth, some of you may know, is a, was a German artist in the transition from the 19th into the 20th century. Um, I was never that interested in his work. I knew about his work, but I wasn't interested in it. I always thought it was sort of lurid. But I found this dry point in a show up at the Cantor Art Museum at Stanford in a small show they did about artists in Germany who had been labeled as degenerate by the Nazis. And I was just riveted by this dry point because I realized what was happening was that the artist was looking in the mirror and not looking down at the plate where he was scratching. And the result was this image that looked like the self under kind of psychic collapse, like the, the face was just collapsing on itself in a way that he wouldn't have gotten if he was busy sort of checking himself constantly. And at the time I saw this, I was really stuck. The work I was known for were these big sprawling paintings that were based on a kind of worldview that would come out of somebody like Hieronymus Bosch or Peter Bruegel where you're looking into a world and there's lots of detail and lots of swarming images. And I was interested in making paintings where you really had to slam on the brakes and you had to look because there was so much happening that you couldn't get it if you just went by the painting. But I'd been doing that for a long time and I, I was very aware that I had kind of, that the work wasn't challenging me as much as I wanted it to. I really, I really am interested in the idea that when I'm in the studio, that my voice, that my work has a kind of autonomy and it can speak back to me and challenge me and surprise me. And it wasn't doing that. And I um, recently, an, an artist who I respect, Monique Prieto, had told me about how she'd run into a similar situation. And in her case, she was enjoying tremendous success. And she realized she was on her way to an opening of her work in, in Venice, Italy. And she said she realized that the work had completely emptied out and she was the only person who knew it. And she had to take responsibility. And she, after the opening, she called her dealer. She said, I'm taking a year where I'm just going to work. And at the end of the year, if you, I'll show you what I'm doing. And if you don't like it, you don't have to work with my work. And her work changed radically and, and, and never enjoyed the same success. But I had tremendous respect for her for going through that. So I. I decided I needed to do the same thing. And I, I spent about a year just thrashing around, trying different things. And then when I saw this, so a year that preceded seeing this, and when I saw this, I thought, well, this is interesting. Because I went to CalArts, CalArts was really, I would not have become an artist if I hadn't gone to CalArts. If I would not have become an artist if I hadn't met Paul Brock, who ran the art school, and who shepherded me into the graduates program. But CalArts was a very unique kind of thing. It was a program where there were no grades. They didn't, they didn't look at your grades to admit you. You were given no grades. Um, you were told that you were an artist when you came in. You were not a student. And you had to kind of figure out who you were and then figure out who could teach you how to do it. And so we never had like life drawing classes. We never had beginning painting, any of that stuff. And on the one hand, I, I learned an incredible way to think critically and historically, and I learned how to really sort of think, think my work through th from the bottom up. But on the other hand, I'd never done a lot of, I'd never done life drawing, and I'd never drawn myself, like looking in a mirror, which is something a lot of people do when they're much younger. So I decided that I needed to do this, and I 
gave myself a few rules. I said that I had to draw with ink because I didn't want to go backwards and forwards. I wanted to do something that would push me forward and I couldn't go back. I told myself that I had to finish everything I started so that I would turn off that critical mechanism where you're halfway through and you think, oh my God, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. You crumple, crumple, crumple. And I told myself I, I couldn't tear anything up and I had to save everything and I would look at it later. And it went on for months. I would go in, I would work out in the studio, I'd go into the house and my husband would be in the house and he'd say, how's it going out there? And I'd go, oh, it's so horrible, you can't believe it. And he'd go, good, good, you're working, you're working. <laughs> and um, this is not at the beginning, this is further on. I mean, I, one of the things I did was, I, I, very early on, I came to the understanding, as I said, to people when I was telling them what I was doing, I said, I'm drawing from life, but it's not lifelike. And I decided to completely dispense with the issue of resemblance. That I used myself as a model because it was easy. I mean, I could just be there all the time. But I also decided not to worry about whether it was looking like me or not. I thought the point of this is not to learn how to draw something that looks like me or draw somebody else so they look like them. The point is just to get something in the drawing going that surprises me and takes me somewhere I don't know. This was a drawing, um, my husband Bob and I moved to Berlin for four months and this was one of the drawings that I did in Berlin. Um, I, I really grew to love the ink because not only as it were, was the ink kind of stern taskmaster because I couldn't erase anything. But also, the life of, of the line was really fascinating. There's a German artist, Alfred Kuben, who I found myself looking at a lot while we were in Berlin. And Kuben is famous for drawings he did earlier in his career, these highly finished kind of nightmarish drawings. But for most of his life, he actually did these kind of marvelous ink drawings that are, are based on scribbling. And they're just, they have this tremendous ferocious energy built out of the, the ink line kind of turning in on itself and moving back and forth. And I found myself thinking about that a lot. This is, this is the last drawing I did um, in Berlin. So Bob is in that image in the upper right. And then stretching behind me is this, the the skyline of Berlin that I could see from the studio I had while we were there. Um, so when I was working on these drawings, I, I just drew what was in front of me. It didn't necessarily look lifelike, but I drew what was in front of me. I drew me, I drew Bob, I drew when I got home, I drew our daughter who had had our first grandson, I drew my parents who were at the end of their lives. So I just drew what was in front of me. But I'm kind of hardwired for, for allegory and fantasy. Um, the, the two biggest sort of events when I was sort of moving from childhood into teenage years, when I was about 14, my mother showed me the work of William Blake, which I just decided I wanted to grow up and be William Blake, which um, was interesting. Um, and my father took me to see Cocteau's movie, The Beauty and, Beauty and the Beast. And both those things sort of changed the wiring of my brain so that I really was oriented towards what the poet James Merrill once said is like thinking doubly, that everything is itself and everything represents something else at the same time. So it was, as I kept drawing, the drawings moved more away from the strict recording of what I'm looking at and trying to make a mark in relationship to what I'm looking at and more into trying to describe experience in other ways. And one of the things that drove that was that in 2008, Bob was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And so when we were in Berlin, this is, this is one of the drawings done in Berlin. Um, like for instance, Bob would get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and when he did, I would always sit up in bed because I really had to keep an eye on him because in, it, as some of you may know, in Parkinson's your brain stops manufacturing the dopamine that tells your muscles what to do. So and it, it happens gradually and gradu you know, gradually you lose control over your body. And Bob had been this really splendidly athletic person he was, he was a rabbi, and a friend of mine always called him the athletic rabbi. And it was 
tremendously frustrating for him to have his body gradually stop responding to what he wanted it to do. And so I would sit up at night watching him when he would come back into the bed and then trying to make a drawing that somehow recorded this, this sense of his body becoming unknowable to both of us, that we, we couldn't understand what was happening and how it was happening and um, trying to place that in a really kind of quotidian environment that we were living in. This is one called Artist and Model. This is, this is when we're back home. Um, Bob fell a lot. I mean, he, he, you know, that's one of the things. One of the, we were in a Parkinson's support group, and everybody who had Parkinson's would talk about the different strategies they had for how you fall, you know, and how you tip over and so forth. So this is me drawing Bob when he's falling. On November 1st of 2017, Bob went, in, went into a hospital with sepsis. And we entered a period of a couple months where he had, the, they cured the sepsis, but the trouble is with Parkinson's, if you're not in motion all the time, it's, you need to be in motion more than you need to take medicine. And if you're not in motion, the Parkinson's advances. And when it advances, you can't go backwards. So over two months, the Parkinson's m marched relentlessly forward. I brought him home on December 26 of 2017 and took care of him at home, and he died on May 20th of 2018. So for those months, I just drew him constantly. Um, it became a way to kind of be there with him. In this case, this was on, a, on Christmas Eve, and he was hallucinating. Um, and this one is done two days before he died. It was, it was a way of, I, I was really, really grateful that I'd started this process of drawing from life, you know, five or six years earlier, because this was when I really needed it. It was a way of, of establishing intimacy with my husband and being able to be there with him all the way through it. And he knew, at one point I remember Bob once saying to me, he was, he was, he was not a vain man, and he let me use him in my work, but there was one day that he, you know, he finally said to me, you know, it's really hard looking at these images because I look, he didn't think of himself as frail or damaged. And, and I said, I know, I know, but I'm just trying to record what's happening. Um, this is a painting that was done before, before he went into the hospital, long before he went into the hospital. It's a painting called The Vision of St. Eustace, and it's from about 2000. 13, I think. Um, one of the things that struck me was that, you know, Bob, as I said, Bob was a rabbi. He was, he was very literate. He also had a doctorate in comparative literature from UCLA, and he spoke four languages. He was really a, a man of the book in the, the sense of the Judaism uses that. And, but his body had become an unreadable text. I mean, we, we had no idea. I mean, they don't know how Parkinson starts. They don't know how it stops or you know, how to cure it. And Bob's body just became this unknowable thing to us. Now, the, the title of the painting comes from a Pisanello painting that I have loved since I was about 20. Um, this is the vision of St. Eustace. It's from 14... 1440 around, circa. Um, I, I have always loved the kind of hallucinatory space of the picture, the animals and birds floating in the darkness. I love the unscrolling um, fabric at the bottom, the ribbon, and the way it kind of rhymes with that greyhound's body uncoiling as it chases the rabbit. And I've always loved the story of the painting, which is the idea of somebody, Eustace was a hunter, he spends all day hunting a stag. At the end of the day, the stag turns around and the stag says to him, why have you come to hunt me? I've come to hunt you. And in, in the original story, it's, it's a metaphor for you know, Christianity and so forth. But for me, I always loved it as a metaphor that you are, you are chasing something, you're going after something. And at some point, the thing itself turns around and says, well, you were never hunting me. I've always been hunting you. And so the ribbon in Bob's body over and over again is written, why, why have you been hunting me? I've come to hunt you, which was sort of how mortality felt for both of us. It was sort of like we were engaged in this thing. Bob kept referring to Parkinson's as the unwanted house guest. 
Um, we were living with his mortality. Um, because I, I never learned how to do figurative painting sort of from the ground up, every time I would sit down to do a painting, I would kind of have to invent how I wanted to do it all over again. And so, and you know, that's kind of counterproductive and frustrating in some ways. Otherwise, it's, it's, it can be tremendously um, interesting and, and engaging. In the case of this painting, I, I kept saying to Bob, I don't know how I'm gonna paint you. I don't, I don't know what I'm, how I wanna paint your body. And we went to the Getty and they had a show of Byzantine paintings. This, so this would be about 2013, I think. And, um, and the moment we walked in, you know, those Byzantine painters would do this beautiful thing where you would paint a flat shape in a kind of a deep, rich ochre color. And then they would draw on top of it with these gold lines and there's just a few dark lines. And I remember looking at those paintings and turning to Bob and saying, now I know how to paint you. And so that's, that's the way I, I painted him in this picture. And in the picture, I'm up in the upper left. There's a ribbon that kind of loops through the picture. There's like eyelets that are painted to look like they're screwed into the edges of the painting. And then at one point, the ribbon goes through my mouth as if I'm, it's a, it's a bit and, and rains on me. And then the, the dog from Pisanello's painting is down at the bottom, the, the pink dog. This is a, the, the Eustace painting is about five and a half feet tall, I think. These are all oil on linen. Um, this painting is called Artist and Mouse, and it's a small painting. It's about maybe that big. Um, the mouse in this painting is the thing I was referring to about toy making. I, 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 I made, I didn't really identify as an artist until I went to Cal Arts to grad school. Um, when I was growing up, I didn't know any artists. And so even though I had this passionate identification with William Blake, I really didn't think I could be an artist. I, um, and I made stuffed animals all the way from like junior high and high school. I was making them all the way into grad school actually. Um, but in, in junior high and high school, I made them and I sold them. And years later I thought, well, that actually was the beginning of me being an artist because it was me alone in a room, very happily making things and knowing that those things would go out into the world. And, um, and later, in later years, some of the images I was known for were wrestlers who were wearing enormous elaborate ball gowns. And somebody once pointed out that the ball gowns I was painting were based on the mice that I had been making as stuffed animals. Um, when I painted this, I had thought, oftentimes I would use that strategy of underpainting and then overpainting as not as a way to build a whole painting. My friend Monica Majoli will, will do an entire picture where she does that traditional way of building it with an underpainting and then using overpainting. Instead, I've used it episodically when I want to create a certain kind of meaning in the work, when I want to create a certain kind of sense of how, say, an image, a figurative image is kind of apparitional. It kind of it appears out of something. And in this case, I. I had originally thought there was gonna be a top to my head and a body and all of this, but there was a certain point where I thought, oh no, this is part of what's interesting is the idea of myself just getting emptied out somehow. And so um, the, the sort of moss green painting you see is the underpainting and then there's the little bits of, of you know, overpainting happening. And then the studio, the studio became, there's several paintings you'll see that have the studio. The studio became, the place where the paintings are often taking place and the studio walls get rearranged constantly in the paintings to become a kind of collage that refers to things, family, friends, influences. There's actually a very early Pat Steer drawing that I found on eBay that's, that's up here, drawings by friends. This is actually an Ellsworth Kelly drawing of a farting dog. <laughs> um, so, and I, would, and I painted this by, by painting a dark layer of paint, letting it dry, putting a light layer of paint on top of it and scratching through. One of my own criticisms of my work is I think I always should be taking more chances and, and making more mistakes. I think that 
some of the most interesting ways that content can enter into a work of art for me is through something that contradicts itself, something that comes out of going down one path and then thinking, oh no, I'm supposed to go over here and switching, switching your direction. I, I think in my work, I am more intrigued by how meaning works when I can see meaning being built that way than when meaning works in a kind of direct way, one, two, three, four, five. Um, it's part of why I try not to think too much about meaning at the beginning of a painting. Because I figure meaning is sort of like a snowball. You sort of start with a small thing and you're rolling it down a hill and more and more stuff attaches to it and it gets bigger and bigger. So meaning kind of accumulates as an image, as an image builds. And then that, that is what leads you to, to something that, that has a voice back to talk to you. This is also a small oil painting. This one is called Studio Visit. And this painting was done between when Bob, when Bob fell ill and then when it was finished just before he died. It was, it was a painting, it was a very helpful period in that basically I had an hour every morning. Once I was taking care of Bob, I really, you know, I had people helping me, but I, the days were all filled up with, with taking care of Bob. So every morning I would get up like at, 4.30 or 5, I would make a cup of coffee, I'd go out to the studio and I had an hour. And I couldn't think too much, I couldn't spend too long dilly-dallying or you know, spending time looking at a picture and thinking, well, maybe I'll go this way, maybe I'll, I just had an hour where I could work. And I, there's a Ruth Asawa quote I had pinned over my desk about, if you work a little every day, it's amazing how much you can get done. And it's really true. I, I, and it really helped me to stay intact through the whole thing. Um, I was very interested in this idea of the self being something that gets emptied out. Um, I don't know how to completely explain that. I, I, I think part of it is when you're doing caretaking of somebody, by its very nature, your self kind of vanishes as you take care of the other person. But I think it's, I, it goes deeper than that, and I don't know how to explain it. I, it's something that I'm still chewing on, and you'll see a couple pictures where I'm playing with it. But in this painting, I, I was very enthusiastic about this idea of a kind of vaporous self, and I, I took all this white paint and I swirled it around and you know, did all this kind of wet mark making. And I went in the next day, and I thought, I painted H.R. Geiger's Alien. It, it looked so horrible. And so I wiped it out. And when I wiped it out, some of the paint had already started to oxidize and, and stick onto the surface. And I thought, oh, OK, there. That's the painting. That's, that's how the self empties out. And Bob is on the, the paper that I'm drawing. Almost all the paintings in this group of paintings, which are going to be shown at PPOW Gallery in February of next year. Almost all the paintings, when I appear, I'm drawing. And as you'll see, sometimes I'm drawing Bob, sometimes I'm drawing something else, but I'm always drawing. This is a painting called The Goat for Bob Baruch. Um, when Bob and I first got together, um, when we had our first anniversary, I invited him to pick out a watercolor. And he picked a little watercolor I'd done of a goat. And he explained to me that at Passover, you would sing this song called Had Gad Yah, which means it's about a little goat. So every year, the next year, I gave him a, a painting of two little baby goats. And after that, we were off to the races. Every year, I did a, a goat for him. So this was the last goat I, I made for him. Um, and it also it came out of, you know, we'd go, we went to Berlin frequently. We had four and a half months there, but we went about about seven or eight times over the years. And in the Gamalda Gallery are two really beautiful, magnificent Cranach paintings that I love of Venus and Cupid. And I, I was just bowled over by them. I, I did really pathetic drawings in my notebooks of them because I think they're almost impossible to, to capture. Part of what I love in Cranach, and in this painting in particular, is his ability to fold all these contradictions together. So Venus stands on a little tiny narrow shelf. It's like a little stage set. But behind her is this vast dark space that feels like it's just this endless darkness. So it's both shallow and deep at the same time. 
And meanwhile, her body, Cranach has this amazing ability to make a body that is both a silhouette and it's a volume at the same time. And I think Aang must have learned how to do that from him. So that, again, this contradiction of doing something that is all about a silhouette and at the same time it has volume and warmth and presence to it. So in my own way, I was trying to th think about how to do that to make something that was shallow and had depth and had silhouette and volume to it. And this is, there's one other goat painting in the group. The whole group is called Drawn After Life. And um, this one is called Hadgadya. And it's about five feet tall. Uh, it, was, it was an interesting painting in that, as I talked about, Indian painting has had a huge influence on my sense of color. And some of the paintings that are going to follow this are much more about the sort of you can see much more clearly where Indian painting affected my thinking about color. This one, though, I was looking at Persian miniatures. And Persian miniatures have a really silvery, nuanced sense of color. It's, it's all about infinite adjustments between tones and colors. Very, very beautiful. And so I wanted to make a painting that was more nuanced than the other paintings that you'll see. Um, so, and then, and... You know, like a lot of artists, I steal all the time. There's a painting that I love in the Louvre, a Pieta by Egeran Quartin, that's a 15th century painting. And the two cloths that are on the wall, one of them is a patron's robe and the other one is Christ's loincloth, which, you know, makes no difference to the meaning of the painting. It's just where you're lifting your images from. And this is a close-up of the goat. I... I, I want to emphasize something that you know I mentioned when I was talking about Beckman's work. Uh, people have sometimes said to me, "Well, what do the goats represent, or you know, what does what does this animal mean, or you do I do you identify with this animal?" Or meaning doesn't work that way for me. I I really think of the images, the the creatures and the men that inhabit my work for the most part, are like actors in a repertory company, and so. They don't have inherent meaning, but what their meaning comes from is the role they're playing in each individual painting, in the same way that an actor in a repertory company doesn't have an inherent meaning to their presence, but when they're playing a role in a play, then, then that's the meaning they're embodying. I, I, I tend to pull towards animals because of their structures, because of how they look physically, wanting to, you'll, you'll see at the end, there's a whole exploration of one particular animal that you'll see and the drawings that, that really is about exploring the structure of that creature. This is called Ghost in Cavern. Um, this is about five and a half feet long. Um, uh, one of the things that I did in these paintings as I was moving into these paintings, as I mentioned, my earlier work was, was filled with detail and activity. And I was very interested in this idea of how to make an image that was so crammed with detail that you had to stop. But that structure wasn't working for me anymore. And instead, what I started to do in these paintings was to say to myself, nothing goes in the picture unless it absolutely has to be in the picture. Nothing, you know, sort of additional or, a, you know, another an adornment or something. I thought a lot about when I was teaching painting at Art Center, where I taught for 15 years, there was a class I, I taught once, and it had this wonderful woman in it who was an incredible baker, and she would bake cakes and bring them into class, which was just, like, fabulous. And one day, those of us who also liked cooking were talking to her about, you know, how do you get your cakes to be so light? They're amazing. And she said, well, you know, the key is you don't beat the batter. You just beat the batter enough to fold all the ingredients in, and then it happens in the oven. And I remember saying to her, that is the best metaphor for painting. You know, it's like you just kind of put the ingredients into the painting and you kind of launch the painting and the painting lands in the eye or the imagination of the person looking at it. But you don't try to do everything in the painting or to, you know, cross all your T's and dot all your I's. So, for instance, in a painting like this, when I, I had this, I, I had a drawing in my notebook that I had done actually long before Bob fell sick that was 
just this very quick sketch about our relationship. And in the drawing, Bob is this very erect Apollonian figure. He was sort of, you know, he's sort of talking and elucidating things and his hands moved all the time. And in the drawing, I'm kind of hunched in the corner like a gnome, you know, bent over and drawing. So I went back to that drawing and I thought that I would, God knows why I did a black underpainting, but I did a black underpainting and I thought, and I thought, and I'll paint on top of this. I'm gonna build on top of this. And when I finished it, I thought, no, that's Bob. That, you know, Bob was this kind of voluble character. He loved talking. While he was talking, he would often be pulling at his hands or pulling at the edge of his jaw. And so, and I like, again, I like the idea of the figure being kind of apparitional. It's something that kind of appears out of the paint. It's not something that's necessarily completely resolved. And then I'm this kind of, you know, combination fun house um, grotesquerie in the corner. The ribbon at the top is, is directly lifted out of the St. Eustace painting by Pisanello, and then it descends into this kind of knotted coil and in my bowels, as it were, and turns into my tongue when it's coming out near the face. And I'm drawing with a, a bamboo pen that a friend of mine made for me, but the drawing is very, very crude. It's very, very rough. And in these paintings, this, this painting is more typical of what happened in the color in these paintings. What I, what I did in all of these paintings was I would spend a lot of time just layering color on the picture before I would do anything else. So I would paint layer after layer after layer, trying to get to something like a, a deep red or a hot apricot or a pale, pale pink. And I wanted to get the color all over the painting, all over the canvas and really dense so that then the color would give me my marching order. The, the color would tell me sort of something about where I was gonna go. And, and the color would be adamant enough that I couldn't, I didn't want neutral colors. I wanted something that would kind of force me into corners and make me react to it. This one is called Bob Among the Goats. Um, it's probably the only painting that I would never, sh they, these are all being done after Bob had died, but this is probably the only painting I would have never shown him. Um, his body in this one looks really fragile and damaged and that's, that's not the way you know, he thought of himself at all. Um, in the painting, part of what, I didn't really think about this when I was making it, but, but right after I finished it, it occurred to me that in the painting I'm drawing, my hands are at the bottom drawing, and what I'm drawing is the least important thing in the painting. You know, Bob is the most important, the goats are the next most important, but the, the ferns are the least important thing, and yet I thought, fuck, that's, that's really what it's like when you, when you are taking care of somebody and after they're gone, oftentimes you find yourself thinking, why was I doing this stupid thing when I should have been with them or I should have been taking care of this for them? You know, the, you just, you, you take care of the least important things sometimes as a way of distracting yourself. And this one is called Cry Baby. This is the hot apricot painting. <laughs> it, was really, it was really, really fun making a hot apricot color. And part of what I liked about it was then once I got the hot apricot color and I sat down to try and paint flesh on top of it, you can't paint flesh on top of a hot apricot. It just doesn't work. It has to be like green and gray. And that, again, that's part of what I like in, well, in all of art making, but in painting in particular, part of what I like, and especially with oil painting, is that the oil paint has kind of a mind of its own almost. And I like the idea of doing something that, that turns the painting upside down so I can't control it so much. And I, you know, and there's parts of these paintings net that now I look at, you know, I look at that hand that's holding that, you know, the pencil down below and I think, oh my God, what a hunk of meat. But, but you know, I, this sort of goes back to the point I was making earlier. I think, that part of how meaning gathers in a work of art is also through things that later you look at and you think, well, I could have done that a lot better. But that's the way the painting operates at that moment. And I, you know, one of my ongoing critiques of my work is to try and learn how to loosen my grip on the painting and let more things occur like that. Not necessarily, I, it's not that I'm advocating for bad, bad painting or bad drawing. It's just more life, more air coming through. 
This one's called Trauer Arbeit. These are all these vertical paintings are about maybe four feet tall. Um, this one, I, I started with a pale pink that I tried to make just about as pale as I could get it to be, but still have it have a pink glow. I'm in the studio with my studio cat, Nino. Um, Nino was my adored cat, and he, he died the year after Bob. And so in the, in the painting, I'm drawing him, but Bob is descending down into my head. And this, this gives you a clear example of this way of thinking about underpainting and overpainting. I was talking about that there's this very, very loose kind of just putting the paint down and then using a, a brush dipped in thinner to just pull the paint up so that there's just an image there and then doing a sort of an icy blue underpainting over the whole thing and then just doing overpainting on the nose and the mouth to kind of get it to be vivid. I like the idea of where flesh happens becoming a way of thinking about how to, how to focus the attention of the viewer on different parts of a body. There's a painting you'll see in a little bit that really uses that, where I'm really trying to get you to think about if you were touching this part or touching this part, what it would be like. This one's called Jonah. Um, as I said, Bob was a rabbi. He, if, if, if any of you have ever seen the movie The Birdcage with Robin Williams and Nathan Lane, Bob's the rabbi at the end of the movie. Um, he, he, see, his nanosecond of fame consists of him going, Mazel tov. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and he would do, he taught at the Milken School, which is a Jewish high school, for the last 15 years of his life. But, um, but he, he, before that, he was a rabbi at Wilshire Boulevard and in other temples. And every, the temple that we would go to, BCC, is the oldest gay and lesbian synagogue in, in the world. And on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, Bob would, would do a talk about Jonah. And I didn't read the book of Jonah until after Bob was gone. And I read Robert Alter's translation of it. And it's this beautiful, almost a folk tale about trying to escape your fate and trying to run away from it, and that you can't run away from it. And so in the, the painting, I'm at the top. I'm a in a boat, and I'm drawing, but I'm just drawing this kind of spiraling motion. I'm just sort of reacting to the whole thing. And there's this fish, which has this you know, bright, glorious tail up above, but down below turns into this kind of faceless shape. I had this whole idea at one point that there were going to be all of these fish of all different kinds. And this is the epitome of the kind of decision making that I had to do where instead of opting for how I used to paint, which is to enumerate everything in different ways and, and make lots of images, instead I thought, no, I, I did a really quick drawing in a notebook and I realized I wanted something more nightmarish. And what was nightmarish was the idea of lack of personality, lack of individuality, some kind of faceless thing that carries you away. So that's, that's what's carrying Bob away in the, in the painting. I, you know, it's, it, it's really, you're the first group who I've talked to about this work, really. And it's really interesting doing this because I really have always objected to art as therapy. <laughs> and here I am painting my dead husband. And I, I also really don't believe in the idea when somebody says, well, what made my painting meaningful to me was that I, you know, I loved my cat or I loved my husband or whatever. I mean, that isn't how, me how meaning attaches to things. And yet, this is what I found myself doing. And sometimes I think, sometimes one of the most interesting ways to make art is to do something that you really think you would never do and you kind of abhor. And um, I've always made work that's very personally based and is based out of a kind of matrix of my life and my fantasies and what I'm reacting to. But I'd never made work that was quite as, as directly related to what happened in my life as I did in this work. And I still don't know what I think about it. Um, I mean, I had to do it. I didn't have a choice. I really, this is the work I had to do. But I don't know what I think about it still. This is a painting called Kaddish. Kaddish 
is the prayer that you, you say at the end of every Shabbat service. You say it when you go to visit somebody's grave. It's a prayer that really is, as, a, as another rabbi friend pointed out, it's really done to comfort the living. It's not for the dead. But, um, but I knew Bob wanted me to say Kaddish. And so I would, for, for a year, every morning I said Kaddish. And then after that, for the next two years, it was every Friday I said Kaddish. And now I say Kaddish when I'm at Temple. But um, in the painting, Bob is kind of floating up in this sort of leafy structure at the top. I'm down below and I'm writing in a notebook and then the notebook is portrayed so that you can see what I'm writing in it and I'm just making X's over and over and over and over again. Um, there's a kind of way that making marks, just making marks to make a mark became, earlier it's, as well, became a kind of testimony, a kind of witness, just to make any mark at all. I mean, at, at a certain point, you know, when I was with, when I was drawing Bob in the hospitals and so forth, in, I got so that instead of saying to myself, oh, that's a good drawing, that's a bad drawing, I would just say, it doesn't matter at this point. Any mark you make is going to be a mark you made while you were with Bob. And so just make any mark at all. And this, this is, this is a way of painting when I get, <laughs> as I said, I never learned from the ground up how to do a figure painting. And when I get really stuck, one of the things I'll often do is I just smear paint all over the painting. And then I take brushes dipped in thinner and I just start pulling the paint up. And oftentimes, if I want to get something kind of more directly representational or something more emotional, I find that I, I work better that way. Um, there's a sequence in Alice Through the Looking Glass that I've always loved as an example of creativity. Um, in Through the Looking Glass, Alice has come in through the Looking Glass house and she goes out into the backyard and she sees a beautiful garden and she wants to walk towards it. So she walks towards it and every time she does, the path twists itself and she finds she's going away from it. So finally she gives up. She says, the hell with it, in effect. And she walks away from the garden and finds she's walking into the middle of it. And I've often thought that there's moments in creativity that are very much like that where, the, and in, in my case, if I try to paint something directly sometimes, I just cannot get it. But if I just smear a lot of paint on and then just start pulling the paint up, suddenly the images start working and I can find my way into a representation. This is called Job. It's Bob sort of as Job. Um, Job, Job, when we first met, <laughs> this is what happens when you go on a first date with a rabbi. Our first date, we talked about Job. And, um, and in Job, Job has every, Job is a good man who has everything taken away from him by the devil. The devil essentially gets God to agree to let the devil, Satan, take everything away from Job so that Job eventually will curse God. And Job is sort of pummeled by language during the book. It's just, it, I've, I, I loved it before I met Bob, actually. It's just a really interesting book about language and the idea of a deity. And so he's pummeled by language by all these people who come to ostensibly comfort him, but tell him what a schmuck he was and how this must be God punishing him. And when Job finally gets disgusted with how, how abused he is, he finally curses God, at which point God appears out of a whirlwind and says, you worm, I'm God, how can you do this? I'm bigger than anything you can imagine. And there was a thing in the last weeks of Bob's life where I was sitting beside his bed and we were talking and, it went, and he, Bob didn't complain a lot about this. He wasn't happy, but he didn't complain a lot about it. But at one point he said, this is really not fair. And I said, I know, I know, I know it's not fair. I said, I said but you, you do remember what, what God said to Job out of the whirlwind. And Bob said, yeah, God said, go fuck yourself. And that was a very un-Bob thing to say, and yet it was, it was very on, on the nose. And so Bob is covered in, he's sort of covered in and emerging from language. It, actually, it's, it's, the, it's the raw stuff of language because it's all just letters. It never resolves into, into words and language. And this one's called um, Yard Sight. It's about five feet tall, I think, by 18 inches wide. It's very narrow and tall. 
Um, the yard site is the annual observation of the anniversary of somebody's death. And you usually light a candle or something like that. This is the one where I was thinking about, I, it was all underpainting, and then I wanted just tiny places where the flesh blooms, because that was really what it felt like, you know, and in, the, you know, if you've lost somebody, you know, that you, you know, a parent or a friend or something, you know how there's that weird thing that happens after they're gone where you hear a piece of music, you taste something, something happens and they're back there for just a split second. You know, you can sense something about them. You can remember what their voice was like or something. And that, that sense of these little sensory moments that make somebody come back to you was, was something I was really thinking about. And also I was thinking about when, when Bob died, you, you have that experience where you watch the warmth leave the body. And so you, you sort of, it's very moving. I mean, it's, it's I mean, beyond the grief. It's very moving also that sense of how you can feel life vanishing until it, it finally, you know, the top of your head is the last place that stays warm. And then I, the confetti was, I was thinking about how, you know, one of the things that's moving about adjusting after somebody's gone is the world goes on. You know, all the stuff of the world goes on. You know, the, all the sounds and the colors and the smells and the feel, the feeling and everything goes on. And they're not there, but it goes on. And I just, I felt like the confetti was something that was sort of like all that physical information about the world showering down, you know, and, and kind of in a way, haunting the person who's, who's vanished. This one, this is the closest thing to a, just a straight portrait of Bob. It's called My Rabbi. So it's Bob wearing his, his kippah with just his, his ear becoming flesh. It's interesting, though, I, I don't, I do working drawings kind of, I used to do working drawings that were very, very elaborate. And when I did the big paintings, I would not do a whole working drawing, but what I'd do is I would sort of work my way through the painting, doing a working drawing for this part and transferring it, and doing a working drawing for this part and transferring it. So I tried to get myself away from that as much as possible. And I, I don't do working drawings very often now. But I did one for this because I really wanted to make sure I was getting Bob right. And it was interesting. Sh- I, I, w- I wish I'd put the working drawing in, actually, because the working drawing and the painting are two different things. In the working drawing, which is what I kept, um, it feels like Bob. It, it's, just, it's just the outline, more or less, of him. But when I did the painting, what I became engaged with was really thinking about, you know, when you're at in your last stages of life, you know, you're, you're having an illness, you're bed bound, you're dying, your body just kind of feeds on itself. And, you know, Bob's body, you could just see how the flesh was gradually vanishing and, you know, the skull coming forward. And so the painting became more about that. The drawing is more the way I think of Bob, but this is, this is another kind of record. These last two paintings I want to show you before I show you the drawings I'm working on now um, are the last two. They're, they went back to this idea of the self being a kind of vacancy or a, just a, a, a ghost in the studio. They're the only two in which I'm not drawing. Um, this one is called Art Material. And the background was originally that yellow color. And then I smeared blue around to make the studio wall. And then I just did this really fast painting that was also sort of putting the paint down and then pulling it back up to get my face. But by the time I got to this one, I just thought there's no point in even putting a face on it. It's just, it's this kind of just this self that just vanishes. I, and again, I don't, you know, I don't know how to explain them to you because I don't, I don't think when I say that, it sounds like I'm saying something depressing. <laughs> and I don't think of them as I don't think of them as being depressing, but I don't know how to explain them. Um, I think about, <laughs> you know, when confronted with a point where you're not able to articulate exactly how a painting contains meaning, I think about 
there's a wonderful quote where um, Larry Pittman, who's a painter here in LA, whose work you may know, I, I really admire Larry's work. And in an interview for a book that was published by Skira Rizzoli on his work, Helen Molesworth is interviewing him. And at one point she says, um, she says she can't figure out how to make sense of his paintings. They're just, they're crammed with all this stuff, all this information and all these images and all this language. And she says, I can't figure out how to make meaning of it. Can you help me? And he says, I'm sorry, that's a service I don't provide. And, you know, I mean, it sounds sort of funny and snotty, but it's, it's not. I think it's a really, I, I've always loved that. I think that's kind of, I think about how Jasper Johns is very clear in his interviews about I do the work of making the work, and you don't have to relate to my work, but if you choose to, then that's your job. You, you start to look at the picture and think about how it works. That complicated process of how as artists we make meaning is a process of so much indirection and accumulation, and I often think of it as a process of triangulation. You know, when you're triangulating something in a, in a map, you, you don't say, okay, here's the place we're going to. Instead, what you say is, it, we know it's bordered by this over here, and we know it's not in this territory over here, and we know these things here are not part of that area. Therefore, the thing we're going towards is here. And I've always thought that's an interesting metaphor for how meaning in a work of art works for me, as I'm sort of saying, well, it's, something's over here, something's not here, something's down here, somewhere in there is this malleable mass that I'm trying to somehow understand. I worked on the, the, the paintings about Bob took about four years, four and a half years. And as I said, they're gonna be shown in New York at PPOW Gallery um, in February. When I finished them, it was, it was just, I had, I, my studio was a two car garage in Mar Vista that's been converted. And, there really is no reason I couldn't do painting and drawing at the same time, but I've just developed a kind of rhythm where I either paint or I draw. So for four and a half years, I did all these paintings in which I'm always drawing, but I wasn't, other than drawing in my notebooks, I wasn't drawing. And within like days after finishing the last painting, I was just drawing like mad. I was having so much fun drawing. And they're all of hairs. And the hairs have fascinated me for a long time. I think. I think because they're high strung, um, I, I think there's a kind of raw, they're, they're not like rabbits. They're apparently a different genus from the rabbit. And so the rabbits are domestic and they're small, you know, they're round, they're kind of you know, willing to be picked up. Hares are not domestic, they're wild, they're feral, they have long rangy bodies and then these you know, immense ears. And a friend of mine who's a rancher said that hares are the most high strung creatures he's ever seen because they're scanning the, the horizon to see what's going on and they're scanning overhead. Um, and it was in a range of media and I have to apologize right up front because none of these have been photographed professionally. They're, they're just now starting to go off to the two galleries that are gonna work with them. So these are just the cell phone photos that I, I started them here in LA. I went to Berlin for about three months with a friend of mine and worked on them there. And then I came back and I've, there's been more that I've done since then. This one is called After Bresdin. Bresdin is an artist whose, whose entire body of work is basically drawing and prints. He, he, I think he did a few paintings, but nothing, you know, no big oil paintings. Or I think he did works on paper, but for the most part, it's graphic work. And they're kind of these wonderful death-haunted landscapes where skeletons are dancing in the trees or they're popping out of bushes to surprise fishermen. And, and also, I have to, Berlin, if you, want to, if you want to dive into drawing, Berlin is one of the greatest cities in the world to do that because the art stores there are incredible and they have amazing drawing supplies. So I was working with Silverpoint and ink and graphite and all sorts of different papers I was finding there. This is also titled After Bresdin. Um, this is based on when my friend Will and I were um, traveling on the train through the countryside, you go through these birch forests and you see the, you know, these long, thin, white, white and sort of pale brown trunks flickering by you. And so I was thinking about those. I, in the end, I, 
I love painting, but I think of myself as a, as a draftsman first. I think my, my relationship to drawing is more, more deeply rooted in my thinking and my psyche than my relationship to painting. This is one of the silver points. Um, silver point, I'm sure you know, you all know, silver point is a medium where you're drawing with a piece of silver on a piece of prepared paper. And the silver, you don't leave material on the paper. The surface chemically reacts to the silver being scratched on it. So you get this thin, delicate line. Um, you can't really erase. You can kind of knock it back, but you can't really erase. So it's, I, I used to, I started drawing with silver point at CalArts. Um, Paul Brock gave me my first pad of silver point paper. And then I used it over the years. There's some silver points in the catalog, but I, I got kind of trapped by the silver point too. I got so that I thought of the silver point as something that was always about the silky and the really, really delicate and that all the lines had to follow the form and all the lines had to kind of create an opulent sense of fur. And I remember after a few years, I got so sick of it that I did a drawing called the infant griffin in which it's an infant griffin that's been gutted with its intestines hung up on the wall and I thought, that does it. That's the last silver point. And then last year, a friend of mine who's a jeweler, Jim Matthews, made me a silver point tool as a surprise. And it's this kind of thing that looks like it should be in a wunderkammer. It's made out of all these different woods and it has a pearl on top. And as a thank you to him, I, I did a little silver point drawing. And I realized that I could use silver point. I could draw with silver point the way I was drawing with ink. There was no reason it had to be so you know, busy making all these fussy lines. You could draw with freedom. And so I launched back into silver point drawing. This is another silver point drawing. A friend of mine says this is the Bob Fosse hair. <laughs> I, part of what I also enjoy about working with certain animals is the chance to let them sort of spin out and become exaggerated. So with the hairs, the eyes and the ears got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I started to put myself in. This one's called After Tenniel. I was thinking of John Tenniel, who was the illustrator of the Alice books. And I, I've always loved in those wonderful, spiky, detailed Victorian illustrations, how they'll be like the white rabbit has the head of a rabbit and then it has human hands and a human body, you know, and, and the kind of wonderful logic of that, which Tenya was getting from a French illustrator, Granville, who I also really love. This is also a silver point. And this is, there are a group of ink drawings. Um, I don't speak German in spite of going to Berlin all these times. I, I, I'm you know, I was, I was, the trouble is when you're married to somebody who speaks four languages, you get really lazy. You just nudge your partner and go, honey, can you ask him? No. And I, so I never learned German, but I really love the structure of how German works. And one of the things they do is they make words by putting different words together like pop beads. And so um, this drawing is called Hassenblumen Mondkopf, which means hair, flower, moon, head. Um, I would start the drawing by drawing myself in the mirror, and I would draw myself as fast as I could. I, I didn't want to get fussy. I just wanted to do a really quick drawing, and then I wanted everything else to get just more and more elaborate as it went along. Here's another one. There was a point where I was, this is, these drawings, these were done in Berlin. I, I had brought silver point paper with me. And then when I got there, I, I packaged the paper really carefully. There, this was paper that a friend of mine had made for me that where I used tinted gesso to make the surface. And, but when I got to Berlin, I found unfortunately that the paper had rubbed against each other in the portfolio and it had stopped being as responsive to the silver as it could be. I could get a very pale line, but not very much. So I started drawing on them with pencil, and I found that drawing with pencil on prepared paper gave you these really, really exact lines. You got this really kind of f funny, spiky surface with the drawing that, was, that you could not soften, and I really liked that. And I was interested, you know, 
You know, actually, I hadn't thought about this before, but you know, there was that whole stuff about emptying out the self, and then I became interested in this idea of emptying out the middle of the drawing and having things happen on the periphery and scattering the images so that they couldn't really cohere. You know, you didn't feel like the ear on the left belongs to the hair on the right. These are, these are both called seculum, and a seculum is the amount of time that something or someone who has vanished from the world is held in living memory. So I was thinking about this idea of a, of a vacant space that becomes charged with meaning. And this one's called The Hair in the Studio. This, is, this was done when, I, when we got back. This is also the hair in the studio. I don't know, you know, I, I keep thinking about, I have ideas for how these could be paintings, but I, I'm wary. <laughs> I, 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 I'm interested in starting a painting with as little information as I can start it with. And I get a little bit nervous when I've done too much thinking about a painting, because then I, I, I think it's, it's different for different artists. There are artists whose work I admire intensely who work everything out ahead of time. Carol Corumpus, who's an artist who just died recently with somebody whose work I loved. Carol, everything was figured out before the painting even began, and I think her work is spectacular. But I find for myself, I have to start with as little as possible because if I work it out too much, then the painting, or for that matter, the drawing kind of goes inert at some point where I just think I'm, I'm doing homework. I'm thinking, oh, I know how it works. I'll just do this and this and this and then it's done. It's better if I don't know where it's going exactly. This one's called Translation. And it's about this big. Most of these drawings are fairly small. These are, and these, the graphite drawings are done on, on ang paper, which is a kind of a wonderful, very thin paper, but it's very tough. You can, you can draw and erase and draw and erase until the cows come home and it doesn't change the surface of the paper. This is a, a detail of me. I, I became really interested in the kind of way of drawing my, the way I draw also shifts a lot. And I became interested in, in, in my older pencil drawings were much softer, much more caressing, much more you know, trying to make sure all the lines conform to the, to the form. I became interested in the kind of drawing where I would use hatch marks as a way of kind of sort of carving into the form. You know, and doing something that, that constantly told me, I'm making a mark, I'm making a mark, I'm making a mark, and then see if I can build resolution out of that. Here's the rabbits, or the hares, rather. And here's two feet flying away th from the top of the picture. And that's the last image. So, any questions? Any observations? <laughs> yeah, Peter? What kind of paper would that be? It's, it's, it's Ang paper, I-N-G-R-E-S. And it's, <laughs> I, I, I bought a lot of it in Berlin and elaborately brought it home, but you can buy it here. <laughs> I, my, my favorite story, like in, in Berlin, there's a great art supply store called Modular that is just, it's like an artist's wet dream. It's like three floors of just the most amazing art materials. And I was there with a friend and we were looking at this case filled with mechanical pencils and my friend said, look at that one. And there was this, this pencil is the Audrey Hepburn of mechanical pencils. I am not kidding. It's like a, it's not even a quarter of an inch wide. It's like this thin black tube and a little knob here and a little, it was the most. And so we each bought one and we were just, as we were walking away, we were going, this is why you come to Berlin. You find these things you can't get at home. This is such amazing German design. And I get back to the apartment. I notice in tiny letters, it says INSO. So I type in INSO into Google, and I find out it was designed in the German city of Huntington Beach. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's lots of great art materials here. You don't have to go to Berlin to get them. <laughs> I've never done a body of work like this, you know? And it's, it's um, 
at one point, after we'd already committed to the show, I found myself thinking, maybe I shouldn't be showing these paintings <laughs> because they're, it's hard to know how to react to something that is so personal. But at the same time, I, one of my teachers at CalArts was Arlene Raven, who went on to, she was an art historian who went on to be one of the founders of the Women's Building. And Arlene said this thing that really sunk in and I, um, was really important, where she talked about the idea that you need to articulate what your experience is. You need to tell us what it is like to be in your skin and experiencing the world. She said, we, we don't understand how rich and complex human experience is, partly because oftentimes only one group has been allowed to speak, but also because oftentimes people generalize. They think, oh, well, I'll say what everybody else says, or I'll, you know, what I'm saying, what I'm saying isn't important. She said, tell us exactly what it's like to be in your skin, and then we will have a better, fuller picture of human experience. And I thought about that while I was doing the paintings about Bob. I thought, well, I will make the most Within the framework of how I think, which is you know sort of all this allegory and fantasy, I will make the most explicit pictures I can make about what it's like to go through losing somebody and then trying to understand what life is like afterwards. And so, and they are embarrassing, but one of the ways that when I was teaching, that when I would have a student who would get stuck or who couldn't figure out how to get to something that was theirs, I would often say to them, okay, go into the studio and make the most embarrassing thing you can possibly make. Make something that you can't conceive of showing to another person. It may be that maybe it's embarrassing because you are using a medium you can't control, that you, you, know, you're, you think you're really bad at doing something. Maybe it's embarrassing because you're telling us something you've never told anybody. Maybe it's embarrassing because it's an image that you think is you know, too revealing. But the point is to get the work of art to be more powerful than you are, so that you are not bossing the work of art around. The work of art is telling you something that you maybe don't expect. And the only way to get to that is to kind of make something that's so intense you can't imagine showing it to another person. It doesn't mean you're going to make a good work of art, but it does mean that you'll make something that has kind of its own voice and then maybe you can hear something and think, oh, okay, I can go over there and get to something that's mine. And I thought about that a lot with these paintings, because there, there are moments in these paintings where I thought, I, <laughs> I don't usually think this way, but I, I would find myself in the studio at the moment thinking, nobody is going to buy these paintings. <laughs> nobody wants somebody else's dead husband on their walls. <laughs> but, you know, that's how you find content, that's how you find a new direction. So, I, I often think that one of the challenges is not to clean up the work so much, and that includes the whole process of building from a drawing up to a painting. Um, and again, when I say that, I'm not saying that as something where I'm saying other people should do this. I'm saying it more that this is a critique I have of how I think my work could have it a different kind of life, if there was more of a sense of the pentimenti, more of a sense of how one finds drawing, you know, drawings are modified and then they reach some sort of resolution, but you get to see the reaching for a resolution as part of the image. Um, Right now, there's a little voice in the back of my head going, remember this when you go back to the studio. <laughs> um, I, I like, for instance, I think about in Bosch's paintings, one of the things that fascinates me with Bosch's paintings, which is something that, I, that he did not intend, but he did his preliminary drawing in ink, and then he painted very, very thin coats of oil paint. And now that the paintings are, you know, 500 years old, the oil paint has become translucent enough that we can see the ink drawings. And it's kind of amazing because you're looking at, you're seeing exactly what you're talking about, both at once. You're seeing, and he would do a drawing where he would do an ink drawing, and then to 
tell himself where he wanted darkness to just go hatch, 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 hatch. But on top of it is this incredibly delicate oil painting he would do that, as somebody once said, looks like a soap bubble. If you prick it, the, the figure will explode because it's so delicate looking. So again, it isn't what he planned on, but what you have now is a painting that is simultaneously raw and delicate at the same time, which I just think that's a glorious idea. I do think of myself as a draftsman first, but I'm wary, when I'm painting, I'm wary of situations where I might chain the painting down too much to the drawing. And that was, that was my criticism of the working drawings I was doing, was that I had gotten to the point where the working drawings were calling the shots too much. And I felt like I was missing, I, you know, part of how criticism works for me is I, I'm not interested in professional envy, like, you know, oh, so-and-so's in a show, so-and-so's got a good dealer. But I am interested in the moments when I'm in somebody's studio and I think, oh, look what they did. Oh my God, I wish I could do that. And thinking about, and, and, and that's not a technical thing, that's more just about freedom and thinking about freedom. And, um, and I would look at other painters' work there's a painter, Nancy Evans, whose work I love, and she just does the most raw, strange paintings. And they make me think about how one has to let paint loose sometimes to let it find its own identity. And if, you're, if I'm pinning it all down to a working drawing, then I'm gonna miss that. So I also love the idea, you know, I love drawing with different media. And it seems to me that there's a really interesting possibility of just drawing with oil paint. You know, Alice Neal really did that. I mean, when you look at Alice Neal portraits, you can really see how she just, she, she dips the brush in that blue paint and she just draws. And then she builds out of the drawing. And I think that's really inspiring. I really, I love that in her work. Um, hey, yes, we, ha we had a group of painters at one point, this was not like a formal group or anything, it was just, there was a group of us, Monica Majoli, Sharon Ellis, Judy Bamber, um, me, who else, I can't remember who else, that was the main group. And we were, we called ourselves Spit, slowest painters in town. Because we all would work for a long time, I, I would work for a year on a painting, Monica would, Monica has a self-portrait that I think took a couple of years, I just, you know, at one time, it felt luxurious. It felt luxurious to go into the studio and lose myself in the studio and lose myself in the life of a painting and let the painting go as slowly as possible. Then my, a friend of mine, Christopher Ford, um, to Carolina Miranda is a writer for the LA Times and she came to do an interview with me and she interviewed Christopher Ford who was my first dealer and Christopher said, Tom is the Vermeer of Los Angeles. Well, first of all, Vermeer would throw up if he, <laughs> if he ever heard that. And, and also it's just, it gets really tiresome hearing that and, and Christopher came into the studio when he came to see the hair drawings and they were all pinned up around the wall and he stood there for a moment and he went, 24 goddamn drawings. And I said, that's the headline next time. <laughs> that's what I want to see in the LA Times. 24 goddamn drawings. <laughs> and um, I, I think it's really important not to get stuck. And I think that when I was, I think the slow paintings were really fun to do for a while and then they weren't fun. And um, I think it's really important to keep some of us are able to find our material and dig deeper and deeper and deeper. One of the people who I really admire is Dan McCleary. And Dan McCleary basically found his subject matter very early on. His subject matter is still lifes and people sitting in very quiet things. They're people who have, who, who have, have very passive expressions. It took me a long time to really understand how much from body of work to body of work, Dan digs deeper and deeper and deeper. It's very subtle and nuanced, but it is very alive. And I have enormous respect for what he does. But then there are other painters like me who you just have to periodically turn all the ground over and start over somehow because you, you, you get into a corner and once you're in the corner, if you're not careful, you're going to be 
just um, making product. My, my friend Mira, um, her mother Resha was Polish and she was really wonderful. She was a wonderful artist. And Resha, Resha would go into a show and she'd look around and then she'd go, merchandise. <laughs> and I, I never want to make merchandise. <laughs> I, want to, I want to have a painting or a drawing that is slightly ahead of my understanding of what it is so that I'm running after it. If I'm doing the opposite, if I'm saying, you know, oh, I'm going to make 12, 12 drawings of hairs and they're going to be this, 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 and I'm going to bang them out, then it's, you know, there are other things I could do that would be more interesting. So. There, do you know the artist Tom Woodle? Of course. Okay, Tom is engaged. Tom wins the Spit Award for all times because Tom is engaged in, in a painting that he says he may never finish. It's this giant kind of mandala. It is so bonkers. It has like a mantra that goes around it. Each mantra, each letter of the mantra is a polyhedron made out of paper. It's this big. It has letters on every side turned around so that the right letter is in, in place in the mantra, but it's, it's lettered on every side. It has thousands of tiny roses in the background. It, is, it just keeps going and going. And, and every time I go in the studio, it's moved forward a tiny increment. And he's acknowledged. He said, I may never finish it. I'm just going to keep working on it until either it's finished or I'm gone. I, I don't want to make that painting, but I love that somebody out there is making that painting, where the painting is so vast that they may never finish it, and that's okay. You know, but, you know when I did the painting of Bob where the confetti is showering down on him, and I, the, the kind of color I like the most for underpainting is that moss green, because I, I sort of think it makes this amazing color underneath the flesh painting on top. It's the, the greenness is kind of odd, kind of pulse to the, to the paint. But as I was painting it, I was thinking, you know, you could have picked a lot more attractive color than, you know, corpse green for poor Bob at this point. And yet, I think that, um, I think that goes, that's, a, that's an interesting thing you were saying about the Indian paintings. And I think it goes to what the Indian paintings taught me, which is let the color be let the color be emotional. Let the color create narrative. Don't, don't assume that because something looks one way in the world that therefore that's the way it's going to look in the painting. Let the painting take you into another territory and let that territory tell you something back about. Um, and the same thing's true with that, that painting I said I wouldn't have showed Bob, the one where his body is really kind of ravaged. I think that, that one, the, the color is really is really key to that. So. I think it's really important to, um, to, to surviving psychically as an artist as you get older, to have some detachment from what happens when you show your work. And I'm not urging that you know, one sort of separates oneself from the experience or that one you know, loudly declaims how you know you don't care about what anybody writes or anything but you just need to have some space there because you know oftentimes we put our work out and nothing happens and you don't want to you know when I've heard other artists say um, I did a show I did all this work nobody bought anything nobody wrote anything I don't know why I do the work I always think well I don't know why you do the work either because you know I mean you really you have to be doing it for yourself on some level, for, for yourself and maybe a small group of people who you really relate to. I think that it's really important when you're in the studio to, there's this wonderful Philip Guston quote, which I'm sure some of you have run into because it's, it's famous and so wonderful about, you're in the studio, you're in there with everybody you know and everybody in art history you love and they're all in there with you. And then as you work, gradually, one by one, they start going away. And all the people go away. And eventually, you're just there with a few people you know, whose work you really, really love. And then eventually, they go away. And then he said, and eventually, if you're lucky, you get out of the room, too. And it's just the work of art. And I thought about it all the time. Somebody has said, I did this painting, and it was almost like a painted itself. You know, That's kind of the same thing. I think it's really important to create that in the studio so that you really are in there with the challenges you want to have and the questions you want to ask 
And there's plenty of time after you have that, when it goes into the world, to deal with what the world is going to say or how people are going to react or not react. And you'll deal with that then. But when you're in the studio, I think it's really important to kind of construct a barrier there so that you're really there with the questions you want to ask yourself. Your work is amazing, and you speak so well about it. Thank you for, thank you for coming down. Well, thank you. Thank you, you know, for having me. I really enjoyed this.